We Filipinos still have a long way to go when it comes to investing for the future. We seem to prioritize instant gratification, but I think how to invest properly is something that we all need to be familiar with. It's simple, really. You work today, you invest, then leave better tomorrow. Besides, investing shouldn't be scary, you know. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. I mean, I started when I was a teen. I hope that I inspire my kids that when they are old enough, they'll tell me that they're excited to do the same. What's important is to find a good reason to invest. It becomes so much easier when you visualize your goal. People think I travel so much and I have a YOLO or you only live once attitude. But the truth is, I travel because that's my business and I make sure I invest in it, spend time for it, to give people the best experiences they deserve. When people find out that they invest for what I'm passionate about, they always say, what? But I always just tell them that I can afford to fund my passions because of my investments. The thing is, some people are just too shy to ask for financial advice. Like asking for help is seen as a sign of weakness, when in fact, it's through asking that we learn the best way of doing things, even in investing. With ATRAM, you can engage and be confident that you have a partner in achieving your financial goals. People usually think investing means buying a house or retiring. Sure it can, but saving for smaller goals is another way to do it. People think investing is expensive. Nowadays, even with a small amount of money, you can already begin your investment with ATRAM. It's easy to make it a monthly or even a weekly routine. ATRAM makes investing simple, even for busy moms like me. And even if you're always on the go, like me, you can keep an eye on your investments online. Plus, I'm confident that ATRAM, my trusted partner, will take care of my portfolio and make sure it gets invested in the right place. Never settle for average. Why? Because life is what we make it. And a strong investment partner can help us live the life we want. ATRAM is dedicated to delivering an investment experience that helps people get more out of life. In fact, it was built with that single focus to help clients attain their investment objectives. We see Filipinos invest in their dreams and aspirations. With ATRAM, building the future is a task we can surely take on. With ATRAM, you can take on tomorrow. tomorrow. Hello and good morning everyone. Thank you for joining this week's episode of ATRAM webinar series. I am Bea Lambitko, Risk Analytics and Solutions Officer and your host for today. Today's session is dedicated to ATRAM's best performing UITF so 2020. Stay tuned to learn more about these funds and how ATRAM's experts navigated the volatile market to achieve these returns. If you have questions, you may send them as early as now by clicking on the Q&A button below your screen. Before anything else, I'd like to let you know that this session will be recorded and that copies will be disseminated within the day, as well as posted on all our social media platforms. Also, please don't forget to visit our website, www.atram.com.ph, for a more detailed information about all the funds that we offer. If you have any friends who you think would like this webinar but are unable to attend, please feel free to share the YouTube replay of this session. Or you may also visit our YouTube channel, Atram Studio. We would also like to invite you to join Atram's new official Viber community group, hashtag AtramPHCommunity, to stay updated on the latest announcements, advisories, and reminders. Scan the QR code or visit this link, bit.do backslash AtramPH, and get a chance to win Atram merchandise. We would like this webinar to actually be as interactive as possible, so please don't hesitate to send your questions in the Q&A tab all throughout the webinar, as we have a special surprise for you. Each question you send is a raffle entry for a chance to win Atram merchandise. Winners will be announced at the end of the webinar, so make sure to stay until the end. 
One last is we will also be sending a quick feedback survey after the webinar. So we do hope you can share your thoughts with us about our session today and how we can improve on our webinar series. So with those out of the way, let me briefly introduce you to our resource speaker this morning, DJ De Jesus, Atrum's Product Development Manager. DJ has been with Atrum for four years and is looking for innovative investment ideas to continue Atrum's legacy of innovation. He graduated cum laude from the University of the Philippines with a bachelor's degree of business administration and accountancy and is a charter holder of the CFA. Hi, DJ. Hey, Abia. Hey, How good are to have you here. Pleasure are to you? be back. <laughs> I'm good, I'm good, you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm also good. So DJ will be giving us a glance later on of our global offerings as well as the local equity smart index. So we're really excited on that, DJ. Well, I'm excited as well. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll wait for your part. But let me introduce another resource speaker. So also joining us today is an award-winning member of the investments team of Atram. It's Atram's very own Miguel Liboro. Miguel is the Atram's head of fixed income. He completed the BAP Treasury Certification Program and was awarded the number one rank and most astute investor in Asian currency bonds by the Asset Magazine, not just once, not just twice, but consecutively for the years 2015 to 2020. And to add to that, he is also the most astute investor in Asian G3 bonds from 2018 to 2019. So hi, Miguel. Uh, hey, Bea. Morning. Thanks for having me, and thanks for that uh, for that introduction. I wouldn't yeah, say it myself. I said it. I'm if I did, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll say it na lang for you. So really, thank you for taking your time to join us today. I'm sure you're like really very busy. Like for you, is it always a busy time, given that you know you're bagging a lot of awards under fixed income? Uh, I think, I think there's always something that needs doing and when the things that usually have to be done there's always something in the market that you can be studying a little closer just to, to manage uh, the risk of the portfolio or the strategy and to see whether or not um, there's any adjustments that can be made uh, something that actually for the audience today as Bea mentioned she said she's part of our risk group something she helps us with uh, very much as well yeah so I'm sure the audience will learn a lot from you. But before I hand over the floor to you, Miguel, I just want to quickly brief the audience on today's discussion. So we will be beginning the discussion by taking a look at the performance of the Atom funds last year, as well as their ranking against the benchmark and other peers. So let me start it off with the local fund that you are managing, Miguel, which is the Atrum Total Return Peso Bond Fund, and it's our flagship fixed income fund. So if you look at the deck, if you look at the past five years, it has generated a cumulative return of 27.55%. And if you benchmark it against its peers, the Atrum Total Return Peso Bond Fund is also ranked first in long-term peso fixed income funds for the same period. So Miguel, I'm sure like the audience is curious about this fund. So I'll now give you the floor to explain more about it and how you were able to consistently generate very decent returns for this portfolio. Thanks, Bea. So I guess what the most of us are familiar with are the traditional fixed income strategies, which are either classified as long-term or moderate or short-term and conservative. Um, as ours is called total return, it doesn't really allow itself to be bucketed into just conservative or just moderate or aggressive. Um, when we talk about total return, what we try to do is look at the prevailing market conditions or ano ginagawa ng market at the time, what the risks are, what the potential reward is, and adjust the strategy accordingly. And uh, what that means is that in times when fixed income did generally quite well, like in 20. Uh, 19 and 2020, uh, we we were quite aggressive with the positioning when we saw opportunities to buy longer tenor bonds uh, or or higher risk bonds at quite decent levels. We did so. We took more risk because nagmukha na 
it was a good opportunity to generate gains for the portfolio. And those, um, those decisions paid off. On the other side of that, being total return also means that when there are more risks involved, it means dialing down the risk a little bit and managing uh, the portfolio more from a capital uh, appreciation standpoint still, but more on a capital preservation standpoint, um, such as what we saw in 2018 when inflation shot up to uh, highs of 6.7%, which I think is very uh, relevant now. No? Because we're coming from 2019 and 2020 when inflation was quite low. And uh, suddenly, I think people are wondering, lang, we're back at around the 4% level. So uh, what does that mean? Um, and I think that given that we're back at these levels again, it means changing again, adjusting the position of the portfolio to be more defensive. Because unlike 2019 and 2020, where it was uh, very clearly going to be a very good year for fixed income, now um, I think there's still some reason to be optimistic. Pero mas uh, maingat na yung um, looking at the slide you have in front of you, uh, what that shows are some of our positions in, in the total return investment bond fund. And actually, the, the thing I want to highlight there without really going into specifics is how the fund is positioned today is actually very different uh, from what that's showing you, which is the end of January. Because uh, as I said, yeah, it's a total return approach. We don't just buy things and then leave it until the end of the year or until two years later, or three years later. Depending on the conditions, we adjust. So kita niya we have some, uh, we had some bonds, mga five year, six year bonds there. Uh, we actually have a lot less of those bonds now because when inflation started to move up, we started selling those bonds um, in favor of shorter bonds because shorter bonds, like one year, two year bonds, are more defensive uh, in an environment of rising interest rates. Thanks for sharing that, Miguel. So I guess one key takeaway is that there's really active management for the total return peso bond fund. So whether the market conditions require you to go towards preservation or appreciation, so you do make the adjustments depending on your assessment of the market. So I have like a couple of questions here for you to answer, just so, and you know, like I'm sure our viewers are interested to know how you were able to generate that 28% return. So let me start with the first one. So um, what are the fundamentals of the total return peso bond fund strategy? So maybe on top of the things that you mentioned in terms of you know, moving it towards depending on the market condition, like any other things that you want to share about the sure. fundamentals? Yeah, actually at the onset ng sinabi ni Bea, ako yung responsible for all of this. That's actually like a, not entirely correct. Right? I, I leave the team that actually is working very hard at this very moment uh, to be able to generate those returns. Uh, and that's why I'm able to speak to you guys now because actually the market is still open now at 11 o'clock. And uh, if I didn't have that team uh, working at it right now, I wouldn't have the opportunity to speak to you guys. So there's really some uh, portfolio, there are other portfolio manager, managers under me, uh, credit analysts and macro analysts who are evaluating the conditions about do we think inflation will continue to go up, stay here, move lower? We have an analyst really looking at that and uh, helping us determine the view in the market. Do we want to introduce corporate bonds into the portfolio? Uh, is the yield worth it given uh, what you're giving up in other aspects like liquidity or taking on credit risk? We have a credit analyst that's dedicated to helping us answer those questions and determining whether these things have a place in the portfolio. And of course, we have a fixed income dealer or trader who's executing these orders in the market. So a lot of work really goes into the management of this portfolio. And it's really a combination of the um, top-down broad factors, which are mostly macro, uh, looking at factors like inflation, where the BSP is, uh, what the BSP is going to do with policy. And even how uh, policy, policy actions in relevant markets, like the US market or the European market, could potentially affect us but also from a bottom-up approach, especially in the sense of corporates or even specific government securities. Because not every government security is the same. There's short, there's long. Um, actually, today, there's almost 70 outstanding government securities. But not all of those government securities are active. So we have to make a determination. Like, 
So, nakikita nyo, yung mga nakikita nyo on this slide, pinag-isipan talaga namin which of those 70, 70 plus bonds yung papasok dito, di ba? Um, so, really, that's the process. It's it's ongoing. It's not static. And uh, a part of that process is also a Bay esteem, di ba? They're, uh, they're helping us determine whether or not the risks we're taking uh, to generate those types of returns are worth it. So, they help us produce reports that show, Teka lang, you only need this much, uh, but you took this much risk. Is that worth it? And that generates that type of discussion within the team on whether or not the position is appropriate or kung time to get out of the position and look for a better opportunity. So that's what fundamentally you're always trying to do in a total return approach. Look for the best risk-adjusted opportunity at any point in time. It doesn't mean we'll always be positive at every point, but as the chart that uh, the graph that Bea showed you earlier showed, at least over the last five or six years since the fund's inception, I think na nagagawa naman na. Yeah, so it's really more of like a comprehensive analysis as well that you have in your team. So just a few more questions. So this is about um, the market. So where will interest rates go given the concerns about inflation? Yeah, that's uh, I think that's what's everyone on everyone's mind right now. It's definitely an hour, Um I think what people are afraid of now is that we return to parang 2018, where we moved from an inflation of three at the beginning of the year to, like I said earlier, 6.7 by the third quarter. Um, I think that definitely there is, there is concern that inflation will move higher from here. At this point, I don't feel, uh, based on the, the data we're seeing, that we're going to approach those levels in 2018 yet. Uh, remember, it was a very different global economy back in 2018. You had uh, U the U.S. Federal Reserve raising interest rates. Uh, you had global oil prices recovering at that time, um, both of which are not really uh, in play right now. Uh, and back then, you did not have a global recession, diba? Right? So, more people are talking about cutting, uh, sorry, more people are talking about raising interest rates than, than they are now where we've cut to, to for many of us, all-time lows. Uh, that said, I think that there is a risk that inflation continues to go up in the short term. Um, the level that we're looking at maybe is that if it approaches the 5% level, uh, that the BSP may, um, may feel the need to act. It's not our base case right now, um, remember, the BSP has a very tricky job at this point. Their mandate is price stability, meaning controlling inflation or managing inflation. But at the same time, we're coming from a very significant uh, poor economic performance along with the rest of the world. So the risk is if you act too aggressively and raise interest rates too quickly, that you might cause this beginning economic momentum to stall. Uh, so I think the BSP will wait for it maybe wait for now unless uh, inflation does hit that kind of 5%, uh, what I feel is that target for them to maybe adjust. Um, but for now, I think definitely not looking at 2018 levels. And uh, I think you're seeing a healthy adjustment in bond yields in the market today, right? Because actually, for those that don't know, 2020 was the all-time low for yields in Philippine bonds, as in all-time low, not just 2020 low. When we hit the lows back in July last year, those are the lowest that local yields have ever been. And um, I think a little bit of an adjustment from that level to where we're finding ourselves today is, is a healthy one. It's a, even though there's some short-term pain involved for people who are currently holding bonds, um, you need to think about it moving forward. Then, right? uh, do you really want to invest at the yields that we were investing in last year, the right? bad 10 years at two point at the low 2.55 percent? Yeah. Um, and today you're looking at 10 year back at around 3.7, 3.8 percent, um, and, and much better levels, I think, to reinvest. Uh, and that's why a total return approach kind of made sense because we were able to get out of those 10 year positions before they got to these levels, and now we have the flexibility to, to buy back at a certain point when we think the market is better. Um, remember the, the saying, cash is not just cash. Cash is an option to buy something cheaper at a later date. 
Yeah, so thanks so much for that very comprehensive answer, Miguel. So lastly, um, where do you see fixed income moving forward? Um, well, like I said, in the short term, I think it will continue to be uh, a bit painful. Inflation, I think, is not topped out. Uh, we're waiting for it to come out tomorrow. The BSP has given an indicative range of uh, 4.3 to 5.1 percent, and and that's quite significant. Because the uh, inflation range in BSP is actually two to four uh, percent, and the previous print was uh, for January was 4.2 percent. So at these levels, even the low side of that 4.3 is above their target high side of 4 percent, and that's what's making a lot of investors uncomfortable. Um, so in the short term, I do think that inflation has the potential to reach the 5% level. And that's why you'll, you'll continue to see yields move up. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're not really seeing it go to around 6%. Naman. So after the market adjusts, once inflation gets to where it needs to get, I think there will be uh, value in re-entering long-end or longer tenor bonds. And that will... That will actually serve us in two ways. Right? One, it will allow bond funds or bond holders to earn, a, earn at a higher interest income uh, level than they could have previously. Right? I mean, if you were earning 2.5% in July last year on a 10-year and 2.8% at the end of last year uh, and 3% a month ago, today you'd earn 3.7%, 3.8%. Two weeks from now, it might be back above 4 And maybe at that level, it's worth re-entering a 10-year again because you're earning at a better rate. And at those rates, it also gives you the potential for some capital appreciation. Diba? If you like, overshoot your market, you like, it might mean that it was oversold, that yields went too high, and that as they come lower, those that were able to buy them at better levels will make those capital gains, like we were able to back in 2019. Yeah, so thank you for that. I guess... Um, the point is, if there is anyone in the audience is looking for safer investments versus stocks, so fixed income is still one of the options that you have. And, you know, Miguel is probably the right FI portfolio manager for you with the Atrium Total Return Peso Bond Fund as possibly, you know, the right fixed income fund for you. So Miguel, I'm sure later on we'll have like a lot of questions on, under the Q&A section. So I'll pause on you for a while and give the spotlight to our next fund. So thanks again for your thanks insights. Bit. So now let me move on to the next best performing UITF in our sleeve. And that's what we call the Atrium Global Consumer Trends Fund, which has generated a whopping return of 72.18% last year. So that's a wow. And really up to date, I believe this fund is continuing to give us positive returns. If you were also to compare the fund against its peers, the fund ranks first in the thematic peso equity funds. Ranking second on the list is what we call the Atrium Global Technology Feeder Fund, which as you would see, generated a 33.86% return. So now let's call on DJ to tell us more about these funds. All right. Thank you, Bea. Medyo mahaba yung usapan natin ngayon. No? Yes, this will uh, be your spotlight. <laughs> I, I don't like the spotlight joke lang. Um, so let's talk about these two funds. Uh, we've been talking about these two funds. Actually, medyo patok siya ngayon, di ba? Uh, the Consumer Trends Fund, uh, from the name itself, di ba? Consumer Trends. Tinitingnan niya kung ano yung patok ba sa consumption natin ngayon. Whatever we're consuming, ano ba yung pinupunta natin, ano yung binibili natin, yun yung tinitingnan ng fund and dun siya nag invest So, wow, 72%. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, if we look at yung uh, in, since inception return, mga 96%. Wow, also. Uh, Ang laki ng gains. And it's really because if you look at 2020, uh, the themes of the fund were supercharged. Uh, so, Let's explain what the fund is. Um, ang nakita kasi ng Invesco, uh, which is the fund manager of this fund and the target fund of this fund, ang nakita nila is, wait, there are basically two themes na strong sa consumption ngayon. 
One is the digital life theme or how technology uh, changes the way we consume things. Na to the point na pag bumibili tayo, diba, e-commerce is very strong. Uh, I think uh, Lazada or Shopee. Maraming gumagamit ngayon ng Lazada and Shopee. Especially because hindi na sila masyado nakakalabas at nakakabili sa supermarket or sa grocery or sa mga malls. Diba? So instead of having... Uh, to go to those physical places, you might as well get it sa phone mo, tapos uh, tingnan mo na lang yung phone mo, ah, okay, pwede ko na, mabi- pwede ko na yun bilhin. Uh, another thing is video gaming, the entertainment space in the digital life area, na parang because a lot of people couldn't go to sporting events, nod na lang sa Twitch or nod na lang sa YouTube ng mga videos ng mga people playing video games and a lot of people tend to buy the video games after they watch. Ah, okay, ang galing ni- ng person na to sa paglalaro. Okay, I want to be as good as him. So, ends up buying the video game and then playing the video game as well. And video gaming is so uh, varied other than the esports and the streaming area. You also have those uh, apps that you can carry anywhere. The video gaming is on your phone already. Whether uh, nag-mobile legends kayo or nagpo-Pokemon Go kayo, it's something that is already ubiquitous. Everybody's doing it. And pag walang time, di ba? Or pag may konting amount of time, mag-video gaming na lang. So that's the digital life theme. You also have the experiences theme or the digital media. Maraming, uh, maraming tao ngayon, di ba, hooked sa social media, Facebook, Instagram. Di ba, Bea, di ba, Likely, meron ka, di ba, na Facebook and Instagram friends din tayo. For sure, diba? yes. <laughs> so, effectively, di ba, a lot of people have that social media as a currency. Na parang, ah, okay, yun yung reputation mo, yun yung, that's you. Because that's so important, parang a lot of people want to look for different experiences. Like, for example, restaurants, di ba? Pipicture ka ng mga food mo. Na parang, bakit, bakit mo pa hihintayin yung food at papalamigin? Para makakuha ng picture, di ba, for Instagram. So, that, those kinds of uh, experiences, mga restaurants, mga travel, mga, even yung mga clothing, mga luxury brands na para lang uh, pogi ka or maganda ka sa you know, IG pic mo. Uh, those are the things that this fund looks at. So, uh, what's so nice about it is trends nga yung tinitingnan. Ano yung patok? So, for the global consumer trends, you could see a lot of the fund, uh, a lot of the names that it's invested in is either one of those uh, three, uh, whether it's e-commerce, video gaming, or yung experiences like Amazon, Alibaba, C. Those are all e-commerce names. And then on the video gaming side, you could see Activision, Blizzard, and also see uh, CD Projekt as well. And then on the experience side, uh, experiences side, you have uh, names like Eldorado Resorts or Penn National Gaming. So yung mga, um, yung mga places that you'd want to go to. So it's a good balance between yung inside life natin or the digital life uh, without going outside now that there's COVID and also yung reopening theme na ah, okay, pwede na ulit mag-travel may vaccine, medyo kampante na ako so uh, because of the vaccine people are becoming more optimistic also on the experience, uh, experience side and going to the restaurants, going to hotels, going to uh, you know, leisure parks Ah, uh, we will move to the Global Technology Fund. Uh, for the Global Technology Fund, this is a peso denominated UITF. So both the consumer trends and the global technology are denominated in peso. So um, this fund is uh, invested into the Fidelity Global Technology Fund. And uh, as compared to the global consumer trends, this is actually more on the pure tech side, uh, looking at yung mga semiconductors, yung drivers of technology talaga. Uh, 
So you could think of technology in three ways: software and services, which is the one that we see a lot. Yung mga Microsoft, mga Apple, mga Google, de ba? Software and services yung normally what we see in tech. But there's also the technology, hardware, and equipment. So, like for example, your laptops, your computers, your smartphones, and also mga semiconductors and semiconductor equipment, or what's powering that. Uh, the beauty of this global technology fund, and I, I know that there are a lot of global technology funds now here in the Philippines, uh, but zeroing in on this particular fund, its focus is what is powering technology. Ano ba yung long-term drivers of technology? Ano yung uh, what will continue to be winning because we keep consuming technology and we keep using technology. So, of course, if you look at the top 10, you'll have names like Microsoft, Apple, Alphabet, Samsung, diba? those big tech names that uh, everybody knows. But you'll also see names like NXP Semiconductors or Hon High Precision, which is on the semiconductor side, what's powering the technology. And you also have things like Cisco and SAP, which are uh, able to provide you mga tech solutions for work. So... Technology is very important in our lives today. Uh, where you know, I think this webinar is a good example of technology. Uh, you know, being able to help us, being so that we will be able to reach you, uh, our clients, and uh, everybody who wants to know more about investing, diba? So it's it's a great platform for people, and we both see these two funds, the consumer trends and technology as long-term drivers of growth. Meaning, these are things that will stay. It's hard to bet against these uh, because, you know, even yourself, you're using it every day. So why not invest in it? Yeah, thank you so much. That was a very comprehensive explanation of those two funds. And I think for those two funds, I won't have much questions because you explained it very well. I was able to relate on the trends, especially the Shopee, because I always use that. As this my, fun uh, has Shopee, by the way. Cool. Uh, consumer trends, it does. Uh, so Shopee is owned by SEA or C, and uh, C is in this fund. Uh, actually, even Lazada is in the fund. So Lazada is owned by Alibaba, and Alibaba is one of the top holdings of the Consumer Trends Fund. So both Shopee and Lazada are in this fund. Yes, it's good to hear because these are the trends that we have right now, especially um, because of the pandemic, we're gearing towards those tech or e-commerce um, related companies. So we have a couple more funds, DJ, so I hope you'll be patient with me because this will be like a lot of discussion for our next funds. So, but before I move on, so I just like to remind everybody, there will be a Q&A session later. So if you have questions, Please keep them coming and you'll also get a chance to win Atra merchandise when you ask questions. So next on our list, DJ, is the Atrium US Multi-Asset Income Feeder Fund. It's a US-centric fund that's diversified across a couple of asset classes and pays out regular income. It is also ranked number one among its peers in the Peso Global Balanced Funds, delivering a return of 14.70%. So DJ, can you give us a glance of this fund? Okay. Um, so this U.S. multi-asset income feeder fund, it's a really good fund, uh, especially if you want U.S. exposure, especially because the U.S. makes up most of the uh, market today. Uh, what we want to say first is, where does the U.S. multi-asset income fund? It's not like your regular multi-asset income funds that invest, okay, part in fixed income, part in equities. Uh, it's not actually like that. Um, it's kind of like that, but it's not. Uh, so it has a one-third, one-third, one-third allocation across three different asset classes. One is high yield, uh, so U.S. high yield. Two is U.S. convertible bonds. And then three is U.S. equities. Now, the fund is structured in a way that uh, you're able to get regular income streams from this fund. So actually, this fund pays around 4 to 5% per annum. Uh, in, uh, and it's normally paid to you. Right? So 
para siyang dividends uh, in a sense that uh, this fund is income paying it provides you unit income that is auto redeemed so effectively you're able to enjoy that 4 to 5% income stream because of the investments into US high yield convertible bonds and to uh, equities now uh, if you look at the names you could actually see names that are very familiar diba you have your alphabet microsoft apple amazon facebook Uh, and then you also have things like Tesla, Broadcom, uh, Donaher, Microchip, and Snap. Uh, looking at these top 10 holdings, you, you see a lot of tech here. And to be honest, if you look at the markets today, it's already dominated by tech. Uh, so even in the U.S. market, you'd see a lot of tech names. Uh, what is great about this fund, the U.S. multi-asset income uh, feeder fund, is that the target fund, Alliance Income and Growth, actually tells you more about this fund. It's, it provides you that income, the 4% to 5% per annum, but also it provides you growth. Uh, and like the two funds, the consumer trends and the tech, we're talking about long-term structural secular growth, meaning these are trends na matagal, uh, matagal na magpa-play out, matagal na you could benefit from it it's not only a fad na ano tawag dito uh, pupuntahan mo lang these are long term trends that will stay uh, so I, i hope that provides you a bit more color on the us multi asset income fund yes yeah, so thank you for that so i guess for this fund for multi asset income fund so Who, what do you think should be like the profile of the investors who should be, you know, considering this feeder fund that we have? So for this particular fund, people should be moderately aggressive. Uh, not so aggressive na equity stocks. So parang if medyo natatakot ka sa 20% losses above, 15%, 20% losses above, then pero parang okay ka naman na... Uh, above 10% loss. May mga that kind of range, mga 10 to 20% yeah, yeah. loss. But you also want parang double digit returns. This one is perfect. So it won't reach yung mga like yung mga consumer trends na 96% or it won't reach uh, yung mga global tech na 33%. But this will be able to reach mga at least double digit. Mga um, Like last year, diba? it performed pretty well, 14%, if I'm not correct. Uh, so that kind of uh, return, that's the, that's the profile of this fund. People who are moderately aggressive. And it's really good uh, for people in their, I think, life cycle-wise, 30s, 40s, perfecto, uh, this particular fund. Because you get income and you also get growth. Uh, parang best of both worlds siya. So, all right, so it's income plus capital appreciation for U.S. multi-asset income. So if you're okay, we can head on to our fourth feeder fund. We have three more here. So the fourth is your okay. Atrium U.S. Yes, that's why this is your show, DJ. So <laughs> Atrium U.S. Equity Opportunity Feeder Fund. So it's a U.S.-centric growth fund that invests into U.S. equities And if you look at the five-year cumulative return, it's 123.08%. So that means if I had invested on this fund like five years ago, I would have more than doubled my money. So DJ, this is like a very fascinating feeder fund. So can you share more information about this fund? Okay, great. Um, for the U.S. Equity Opportunity Feeder Fund, we've talked about global tech. We've talked about global consumer trends. And uh, they make up two out of the three big themes uh, that is invested by the U.S. Equity Opportunity Fund. So one, again, it's uh, digital life, the financial services transformation. It actually uh, also goes to like my PayPal. I uh, think yung, our, our local equivalent, PayMaya, Gcash, that's the type of funds that it, it invests to, yung fintech, the, because of how much we use e-commerce, Uh, even that side, yung financial uh, transformation side of tech, uh, that's also what it invests in. Of course, second is yung advancements in tech, 
as well like mga cloud computing yung mga ano tawag dito things that are able to help our work uh, environment but also it invests into healthcare tech and you know given the pandemic uh, we know that it is a healthcare crisis other than being a financial crisis diba uh, alam natin na last year ang hinahanap ng mga tao was the vaccine and now that dumating na vaccine a lot of the you know healthcare providers uh, the pharmaceutical companies that were developing the drugs were being able to uh, release now diba? and benefit from this uh, COVID-19 thing. Diba? Uh, it's actually invested into Novavax, uh, one of the less, um, less discussed vaccines. Uh, I think the effectivity of their vaccine is around 88%. So that's why, you know, medyo na mas nakikita yung mga Moderna or yung Pfizer. And yun yung nakakarating dito sa Pilipinas, di ba? Th- those are the ones that we're hearing that will come here to the Philippines. So uh, it has that angle wherein if you're looking at healthcare, and I know there are now new healthcare funds in the market, uh, but if you want a solution wherein... Well, I don't know where to invest. I don't know if I want to invest into global tech or global consumer trends or global healthcare with other providers. And uh, minsan iniisip pa, oh, magandang time ba bumili ngayon or not? This this fund will do it for you. Uh, although this one is US-centric. Uh, again, if you look at the names, very familiar names, Amazon, Microsoft, MasterCard, Apple, Visa, ServiceNow, you know, Alphabet, SBA communication. So that's what this fund looks at. The long-term themes, it's a growth fund in itself uh, because it's focused on long-term growth and what uh, will continue to drive growth in the future. So this one, DJ, is living by its name that it's an opportunity feeder fund. So taking yes. advantage of the growth um, stocks that it'll, it will invest into. All yes. right. So that's everything that you have for equity opportunity, right? So we can pre- proceed to the next if you're okay already. All right. So we have two more since we have a lot of feeder funds for our investors. So next up is our core pure global multi asset fund, which we call the Atrium Global Allocation Feeder Fund. So if you look at the ranking, so this one is also ranked number one among its peers in the dollar balance funds division and has delivered a return of 18.88% and a cumulative five-year return of 44.69%. So DJ, what is this fund about? Uh, I, I just want to take some time to say na ang gaganda ng returns, no? Yes, I agree. <laughs> Global digit in a 2020 year. It's amazing. Um, so, looking, and, and I think a lot of people are asking, bakat ang taas? Will that be sustainable? Um, pero, I, I'm so amazed with the people who are running this fund. Uh, it, this fund invests into BlackRock Global Allocation Fund. And uh, the, the target fund itself is mga $12 billion. Ganun kalaki siya. Meaning, uh, there's a lot of investors that are, are relying on this fund for uh, a lot of reasons. Because you could invest into the global allocation fund and then not think about anything next. It's invested into basically almost everything. Uh, diverse uh, you know, set of assets. It, invest into fixed income, it invests into equities, uh, it has some exposure to gold. So para everything that you need to start investing, it's in this global allocation fund. And because so many people are invested into um, this particular fund, $12 billion worth, right? Uh, BlackRock decided to put their best resources in this particular fund. They have their uh, chief uh investment officer for fixed income to be the macroeconomic head and the primary uh, portfolio manager for this fund. He's, his name is Rick Reader. And 
having a macroeconomic sense, being able to know what uh, the economy is, is very important in fixed income, as Miguel would uh, attest. Right, Miguel? I think Miguel's uh, not here. But, yes, uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, so economics is very important uh, in understanding the markets. Um, that's supplemented with uh, Ross Koisterish. He's the head of uh, quant strategy in BlackRock, and he's also the quant strategist for this fund. And also, uh, you have Kate Moore, who looks at the thematic strategy. So looking also at the long term and making sure that uh, it fits uh, these themes that we're seeing right now. Uh, this Global Allocation Fund is very good in a sense that in 2020, it was looking at the same themes, uh, digital life, uh, technology, healthcare. But now that we're seeing recovery, they're doing a barbell approach for that. They're investing into those digital life um, technology and healthcare, but also investing into cyclicals like financials, energy, industrials that will benefit from us opening up our economies. Uh, global allocation, therefore, is your one-stop shop for everything around that's global. And uh, because of its flexibility, because of its active management, you can feel safe that if you put your money there, uh, chances are the fund will grow. All right. So if our investors are looking into like globally diversified multi-asset funds, so we could say, right, that this global allocation is one of the options that they have. Yes. All right. So let me move on to the last feeder fund that we have. So I hope Miguel is okay waiting for us. We still have two before we head on to the Q&A. And please keep those questions coming if you have. So one last is joining our list of the best UITFs is the Atrium Emerging Markets Equity Opportunity Feeder Fund, which if you look at the ranking, it is ranked first for the one year, three year, five year returns or performance among its peers. And if you look at the cumulative five year return, it's given us an 89.48%. So can you tell us more about this fund, DJ? They, uh, this is actually one of our first feeder funds. So oh. it, we're, you know, it, it makes me happy that you know, one of the you know, funds that we've had for so long is performing really well. And it's a sleeper fund. There are many people who don't fund na to because they think, ah, emerging markets, uh, okay, it's a risky one. It's a risky Medyo nakakatakot yan. Sige, hindi muna tayo mag-invest yan. But if you understand the fund itself, and I think this is what this talk is all about, na parang we need to be able to understand the fund so that we know what to invest in. Diba? Emerging markets equity opportunity, I call this the, the sister to US equity opportunity. Um, because I call it the sister because it's very similar in what it does. It looks at long-term growth themes. It looks at uh, what you can uh, invest in and what will you know continue to be long-term drivers of growth. What the emerging market does is, let's define what emerging markets is. There's three uh, major emerging markets. You have Asia, uh, emerging Asia, and uh, you also have EMEA, Emerging Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And then you also have Latin America. But emerging markets is actually predominantly Asia because it's predominantly China, Korea, Taiwan. Yeah, so that's, I think I'm missing one. <laughs> China, Korea, Taiwan. Oh, well. Uh, so with emerging markets, it's predominantly that. So if you look at the names, you have Samsung, you have Taiwan Semiconductor, you have Alibaba, you have Tencent, you have Naspers, uh, you have ICICI Bank, you have LG Corporation. So you're looking at these companies, uh, these names that are, you know, able to provide you the same things, tech, uh, digital life, and healthcare, but from an EM perspective. So if you put together your US equity op and your EM equity op, you have the perfect, you, you basically have a perfect fund. <laughs> uh, and it's, 
if you're aggressive enough to go for these kinds of returns yes uh, if the market is down and uh, miguel diba inflation is a big concern for equity markets in general as well uh, right miguel yeah absolutely wala naka off video lang muna ako kasi it's your show bro ug <laughs> <laughs> naman um, so basically for em equities uh, it's it's very important to also be aware of the inflation aspect but at the same time because these are focused on long term growth drivers it's focused on earnings growth uh, you can feel you know a bit more secure that it's invested into things that are going to you know persist long term all right thank you for sharing that dj so this is the last before the q and a but this is definitely not the least so if you look at the next slide, so it's the Atram Philippine Equity Smart Index Fund, which also ranked first among its peers per quarter ranking versus the active and passive peso equity index funds, garnering a four-year return of 6.44% and outperforming its benchmark by 2.07%. And you know, just to clarify, it's a four-year return due to the inception of the fund. That's why that's the period that we covered here. So can you walk us through, DJ, on the Philippine Equity Smart Index Fund? The Philippine Equity Smart Index Fund, it's a, it's a very interesting fund because there are a lot of index funds in the market today. Uh, if my count is somewhere in the 30s uh, when I looked at the, the whole industry of index funds. So it's hard to really decide, okay, why would you invest into an index fund when there's around 30 of them, and then you have the FMETF, which invests already into, you know, index as well, right? So, yeah, so it's more of like what makes it smart. What makes it stand out, right? Yes. Uh, but this is the first quant fund in the market. And quant meaning it it looks at the rules. Parang tinitingnan niya, okay, ano ba yung dapat tinitingnan? Ano ba yung signals para bumili or bumenta ng isang stock, di ba? Uh, so, for this particular fund, sa Atram, we love our fund scoring. Eh. Uh, so, we have something called a quant score. And para siyang secret recipe natin na parang, ah, okay, ano ba yung best combination ng etong factors? And there are four factors. You have uh, momentum, you have quality, you have earnings and sentiment, and you have valuation. Those kasi naman drive the markets, diba? Yun yung mga tinitingnan ng mga players ngayon uh, in deciding, okay, will we buy this stock? Or will we sell this stock? Will we hold this stock, diba? Um, we've done it in such a way na may formula kami, may secret formula kami na, okay, ito yung score mo. Ito yung score mo for a company. And if mataas yung score, edi eh, dapat mas binibili natin. If mababa yung score, dapat medyo tanggalin natin or underweight natin, di ba? Huwag, huwag masyado natin i-invest. And if you look at the scores in 2020, no surprise, medyo mababa. So what our fund manager did was in-increase yung cash level. Si Evan, he talked about this uh, two weeks ago. Yeah? And they they really raised cash for this because they knew that you know philippine equities would be hit by covid diba? we don't really have a lot of digital stocks i think uh the, the the best that comes into mind are the telcos and converge diba? so if you're looking at the large caps and that's basically what the index is it's the top 30 largest companies in the philippines you want to be active also and be able to manage you know, tough spots wherein our index fell so much <laughs> because of the COVID pandemic. And this is where this fund shines. It tries to give you outperformance against the index through that uh, that match of ito yung score, okay, ano yung gagawin natin? <laughs> and that's basically the Philippine Equity Smart Index Fund. It's, there's nothing like it in the market uh, today wherein uh, it's really parang a score that's dictating uh, the buy-sell of this. And, you know, 
the proof is in the pudding. Tingnan mo yung benchmark margin, di ba? 2.07%. Uh, in the four years. So that's what you can expect from this fund. All right. So thanks for those insights, DJ. I think that's everything on your part. You've given our audience like a wealth of information about the feeder funds as well as the local equity smart index fund. So as you have seen, right? So Atram has a wide range of investment products and our capabilities span across several asset classes. And that's meant to service the different investment objectives of each individual. So for today's session, I hope that the information that we gave you helped you towards your investment journey. So I think at this point, I know that it's almost lunch, but I hope we can take a few um, moments of your time to actually answer some of the questions from the audience. So we have several questions coming in. And we may, can I call on Miguel again and also DJ so that I can give you the questions that our audience want to know about. All right, so here's the first one that's coming from our audience. So the past performance does not always reflect what will be in the future. Given that the past year's performance looked good, could you please share what Atrium's outlook would be for this year, given that the vaccine development status is not very stable? And also, how about the impact of election next year? What's the market impact of these? Maybe this one is for... Miguel, though if you have insights, DJ, you can feel free to chime in. Sure. Thanks, Bea. Uh, that's actually a very good question, and it, it helps us clarify a very important point. No? Um, uh, as, as mentioned, uh, past performance, while, in, while uh, a good, reliable measure of how uh, fund strategy is done, is not necessarily indicative and is certainly not a guarantee of future performance. Everything, of course, will still depend on the market and the management. Um, with that said, how are things shaping up? Um, well, we all know that in 2020, uh, fixed income generally as an asset class, both locally and globally, uh, outperformed equities in general, although global equities did reasonably well. Uh, and the reason for that was in a time when there is a lot of uncertainty, people or uh, uh, investors tend to go for safe haven or uh, more stable asset classes, as opposed to moving to risk assets uh, such as equities or commodities. Uh, and you saw that very keenly back in back last year in 2020, because everybody was busy selling equities, selling commodities, and moving into fixed income. And that's really what contributed to why uh, fixed income had a very good year last year. We're reversing that a little bit. Um, we're coming off, as I mentioned earlier, not just year low, but uh, all time lows in some cases of uh, policy rates and interest rates. And because of that optimism in the market, you are seeing a shift back towards uh, traditional risky markets, such as equities and commodities. Um, and, and that's accounted for the recovery. Um, moving into the, the second part of that question, what does that mean for the Philippines really? Um, I think that despite the fact that global equities did well uh, even towards the end of last year in recovering, the Philippines was a, was a kind of standout underperformer, right? Uh, and, and there are a lot of factors contributing to that, uh, which if you want to hear about it at length, uh, you can check our recent outlook video. Um, and that's actually why we think that Philippine equities, as DJ mentioned earlier, is in a very good position to stage a recovery from this point. Um, now, it's true there is a lot of uncertainty still on the implementation, the rollout of the vaccine program. But when you look at it from a base effect standpoint, uh, simplistically, it's do, you, do we really think things are going to get a lot worse from where they were last year and from where we kind of are today, where a lot of that negativity is already priced in at these current asset prices? Or do we think that there is a better chance or probability that things get better incrementally from here, that we don't go back into a prolonged, sustained lockdown in the Philippines again, but slowly open up as we've been doing, and uh, in the hope that yun nga, di ba, na ma-implement talaga yung vaccines na eventually mag-form ng herd immunity, and that things start moving towards a new normal. 
nothing like I believe not not like anything we knew before, which is the old normal, but something a bit more open and a bit more regular than what we had last year and what we're dealing with now, right? like a new equilibrium. Um, and I think that's what we're in store for. Right? I think that the worst is behind us. I hope it is. Uh, and that there, there is a lot of scope for recovery. Um, and because of that, that is why as a, as a house, we are quite um, constructive on, on equities, Philippine equities specifically. Now, the last part of that question, elections. How do we think that's going to affect the, mar affect the market? Historically, for the equity market specifically, elections have been good. Elections means more politicians trying to get their name out there uh, and spending, spending because they want to get their message across. What does that do? That, boot, that creates jobs, that boosts GDP. It's good for economic growth. Um, it also means that outgoing politicians want to show that they, that they have done something. So it means usually a backloaded um, backloaded increase in the number of products you see. So it'll probably mean and dami ng da daan ulit ginagawa kasi <laughs> everybody wants their name there to be projected ni ano, di ba? And, and again, di ba? Um, notwithstanding the increase in traffic short term, it's good long term. And uh, it creates jobs. And, and we need that right now. We're coming from very high unemployment levels, understandably, because of the pandemic. And that's the type of, uh, that's the type of improvement that we foresee in the economy. And, it coming in line with an election year, I think will be a very good boost for the local economy. If I may add, um, if you think about re recovery, that's where we are right now. That's what we're seeing in the market now. Na parang lahat ng things are lining up na medyo, okay, daganda na yung economy natin. And recovery is the, the, the time you'd want to actually be starting to invest because kapag nag-recover na tayo edi di ba you missed out on the growth of the recovery or habang low base pa tayo and especially because of the inflation concerns it's actually a good time to invest um also looking uh, looking into the global markets and giving a bit of color as well on uh, these themes uh, information technology uh, and the advancements of technology, digital life, healthcare, these are themes that will persist. Uh, these are themes that will continue to move and uh, grow markets moving forward. They've become kind of like utilities at this point. Na parang kailangan na natin sila. Uh, and in a sense, that gives you some safety in the in having you know, invest in these funds. Do we think that they can do you know, what they did in 2020? Maybe not. But would it give you uh, returns that are solid and uh, you know, be able to build whatever you want to build in the future? Yes. Thanks for that answer. The second question is actually related to that. So it's either Miguel or DJ, any of you could answer. This one you mentioned, Miguel, that the Philippines is lagging behind the world in terms of economic recovery. So our, one of um, the members of our audience is asking, do we put more weight on global equities than the local ones? Or is, are the US stocks expensive right now? Or in terms of like the global equities, is it a good time to enter it even if the valuations are high? Uh, that's that's a good question. It's a bit tricky, actually. So global equities are at very high levels, something that DJ mentioned earlier. But at the same time, they also have, uh, these economies also have a growth momentum that is still being sustained. And it's being pushed further along by the fact that from a vaccine rollout and implementation um, standpoint, they are definitely in a better position to implement this than we are locally. And that's just a case of being like a very developed economy versus a less developed economy. Um, and so there is, I think, still room to push forward there. Uh, levels do look quite expensive. And at this point, it, it, it's definitely looking less like a 20 to 50% year-end return like what DJ showed earlier, but do I think that there's still some upside potentially there? Yes, it, it looks like there still is. Um, all the global research we're seeing is uh, in support of that, that there is still room to, to move there. 
but yes, that's notwithstanding the fact that it's a bit expensive. Uh, locally, you have a much more a stronger argument for value, na, di ba? Na, there is risk. There is a bit more risk on the implementation of the vaccine, sustained reopening of the economy, everything I mentioned earlier. But you're also coming from levels that are still, by and large, a lot cheaper than what we saw, um, not just last year, but in 2019, which is not something you can stay, say about these developed economies, right? Uh, they've just kept chugging along, whereas we've kind of gotten stuck. And now it's a determination of whether you agree with what we mentioned earlier, that in our, de in our determination, there is more scope to be positive today than negative from where we are. Um, and it's really that. Because of that, I, we think there's more room to grow uh, from, in terms of the economy and in terms of asset class prices. Um, and really to extend that as well uh, to uh, the Asia region, we were actually very positive on the Asia region and the growth uh, that we could see here. Because if you look into 2020, the, the growth in the markets itself was not reflecting what was the growth in the economies of the Asian economies. We've, we've been able to, uh, as Asia, uh, I'm talking about Asia, we've been able to contain the virus much better than the developed markets, better than the US, better than Europe, uh, to such a degree that a lot of markets, like for example, especially China, were able to open their economies early on and really, you know, combat this virus better than uh, the rest of the world. So having a growth mindset on those areas, uh, that's actually where we see a lot of uh, growth and um, which makes a good case for our EM equity. And it also makes a good case for our Philippine equities as well. All right. So I hope that answered the question of one of the members of our audience. We do have an optimism on the equity side, more specifically on the um, Philippine equities. So the third one is more of, well, it's still related to market. So what's the biggest concern that we are facing right now? And how would you advise investors in managing the risk and managing portfolio when it's going down now? Um, I think right now the biggest risk is that um, the, vac the virus somehow escalates again and it forces both global and local and or into a prolonged shutdown again uh, because then you really can't do much to, to get yourself out of that kind of recessionary position. That is the biggest risk and it is, it's still there. Uh, but as I said earlier, I don't think that the probabilities favor it right now. I think that we're more optimistic towards a gradual recovery. Um, with that said, I, I throw the question back to the audience. Would you rather be investing now where there is some risk of things turning against you, both on fixed income and equities, but where you have, where because of the base you're coming from, you have a much larger potential return profile? Uh, as opposed to having invested back in, let's say, 2019 or 2017 for equities, when things were at levels so high that did it still make sense? I mean, I guess the question I'm asking is, would you rather invest in, let's say, the equity market at 6,800 to 700 or at nine or uh, 6,800 uh, to 7,000 or at 9,000, where you're coming from at that time? And for fixed income, um, do you really think that rates are going to adjust that much higher that it warrants you not having a hedge in your portfolio by continuing to hold a bond fund uh, or a fixed income instrument. Because at the end of the day, diversification is, is very important. Um, when people were asking me for my forecast in 2019 and 2020, uh, I said that based on the factors we were seeing in 2019, we were looking at maybe 7% and in 2020, maybe 5%. And as Bea showed you, we delivered returns far in excess of that. And um, if even if you weren't planning on having fixed income returns of that size, just by having an investment in a fixed income fund 
within your portfolio, you were able to kind of take advantage of that upside potential when the markets reacted the way they did. So just going back into what was mentioned earlier, diversification is very important. Um, outlook and targets aside, there is always a benefit to being diversified because um, where one asset class or strategy may fare badly, another one may benefit. You have anything to add, DJ? Uh, it really is about base. Um, is it a high base scenario or a low base scenario? And you know what's nice about this market right now, it's a low base scenario wherein you have a lot of return to go through. Uh, that said, yes, uh, the challenges would be one would be mobility. Uh, if our mobility, you know, maka ECQ ulit tayo or that kind of thing, that will always dampen markets because that will close economies. Uh, and the second would be really uh, if inflation becomes uncontrollable, that people are not able to consume. That said, uh, we're coming from 2020, wherein a lot of people. The reason why the markets went down so much was because people were redeeming, people were selling, people were removing from their investments so that they have a lot of cash. So there's a lot of liquidity in the market today. Maraming pera ngayon sa system. And I think that's actually what's causing a lot of the inflation other than, like for example, swine flu or uh, the typhoon. There's a lot of factors, really. But... Um, you also have that a lot of cash that you, people can deploy. And once that's deployed, that's what's really going to help uh, from a market standpoint. All right. So I think for number three, the message is, um, I'll also borrow it from Miguel, that diversification is one of the most important tools so that you can manage the risk of your portfolio. So that when one goes down, at least you have a protection from another asset class that could actually potentially go up as well. So we only have one a time for one last question. So, and this one relates to the Consumer Trends Fund. So I'll give this to you, DJ. So for the Consumer Trends Fund, do you primarily focus on companies in the digital space? What criteria do you use in deciding which companies to invest in? And does this fund include both local and global companies? Well, for the Consumer Trends Fund, fund, uh, it's really a bottom-up stock selection. Uh, we do, it does focus on the, the various trends, right? But like all, um, you know, investments, you have to look at the fundamentals. Does the story work uh, in real life? Parang, are the companies being able to see growth moving forward? Valuations, are they cheap or not? It's an actively managed fund. You need to be able to see if uh, the price levels are high or not. They actually do have a sell discipline uh, wherein if the thesis is no longer valid or the price targets have been reached or uh, the timeliness of the theme deteriorates or the fundamentals itself deteriorates, then they would sell the fund. Um, so it's important to see that, oh, and timeliness is also one of the bigger things to really um, talk about in consumer trends. How timely is the theme now? Uh, and that's how they really do the selection for this consumer trends. It can't be consumer trends. It can't be a trend if you're not looking at, you know, there's really a time-bound, uh, you know, factor that you have to consider. And those are the things that uh, the fund looks at apart from you know, the, the general outlook and the general risks as well. Um, so always, uh, Miguel said it, diversification, this fund also looks into that. So while it's digital, you'll see that uh, if you look at the fund fact sheets or the, the kids, you'll see that the fund is very diverse industry-wise, uh, changing on the weights of the themes. Uh, and this fund really is able to, you know, capture different ideas from, you know, what's happening in the world. Uh, one of my fears uh, with this fund was because it was very digital focused, uh, especially in around October, uh, wherein we've been seeing, you know, tech go down and techs going down again. Right? It's not really a tech fund. It's more uh, tech-enabled communication services and consumer discretionary. 
but how will it you know transition when you know risk markets uh, come back again when we go back to cyclical growth when you go back to those energy stock financials and etc but it, it still performed really well and is still continuing to perform really well and that's a testament to the process the investment process that this fund has that even when you know even when things are were starting to look good because of the vaccine the fund was able to pivot properly and still be able to invest in the right teams. And uh, today, that's still what we're seeing from the fund. And that's why we're still confident with the fund. All right. Thank you for answering that, DJ. I would say we really received a lot of good questions from the audience, right? But I think this is all the time that we have now for questions. I know people are hungry since it's lunchtime. So thank you to our audience for all those questions and please stay tuned to find out if you're a winner in today's raffle. Before we wrap up, just any last words, Miguel, DJ? No, that was a lot. Uh, thanks yes. everybody for, <laughs> thanks everyone for joining us today. I hope that uh, we were able to kind of share information to help you in your investing decisions and investment journey. And uh, we hope that you choose Atra. Thank you. And we hope that this really helped also, you know, enlighten you guys that uh, while these are, you know, best performing, they're best performing for a reason. And uh, hopefully, uh, we convinced you enough to, you know, start investing today, especially now uh, with Philippine equities. All right. So thank you again, Miguel and DJ. And of course, to our audience, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us today and extending after 12. So, okay, I'm sure you guys are interested to know more about the funds or how to invest in Atram. So maybe, maybe now call on Nika to tell us more. Good afternoon, everyone. To open an account with Atram, just visit our website at atram.com.ph. Here, you can learn more about all the funds we offer. It will then guide you to our online investment platform, Seedbox, where you can start investing for just 1,000 pesos. But if you have more questions, visit the website's frequently asked questions page, or Adram Academy page as well. And we are pleased to inform everyone that you can soon invest in Adram Total Return Peso Bond Fund, Adram Philippine Equity Smart Index Fund, Atram Global Technology Feeder Fund, and Atram Global Consumer Trends Feeder Fund via Gcash Invest. Please stay tuned for further announcements. Thank you. As promised, here are the winners of our Atram merchandise. The so winners congratulations are, for the both the of you. The first one will is contact you Dennis the details you provided during registration on how to receive your And price. the second one is... Shaira In Santiago. case you have not registered for our webinar, webinar next week, Atram's Equities Portfolio Manager, Noy Yumol, is set to discuss Philippine equities and Atram's strategy for its Philippine Equity Opportunity Fund. Our webinar is entitled, Emerging Stronger, Spotting the Future Winners in Philippine Equities. And if you want to register, you may do so by scanning the QR code flashed on your screen. You may also type in the link found on the left side of your screen. We have a lot of webinars for you. We have webinars lined up for the rest of the month. So I hope that you please stay tuned in for that. Again, if you have any friends who you think would like this webinar but are unable to attend, feel free to share the YouTube replay of this session. Or you can feel free to visit our YouTube channel, Atrum Studio. We would also like to invite you to join Atram's new official Viber community group, hashtag AtramPHCommunity, to stay updated on the latest announcements, advisories, and reminders. Scan the QR code as shown in the deck or visit the link bit.do backslash AtramPH and get the chance to win Atram merchandise. And just one last, please answer the survey at the end of this webinar. We would, we would love to know your thoughts on today's topic. And on behalf of Atram, thank you again for your attendance and participation. We wish for your continued safety and of your family. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.